All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here and welcome. This is the War Industry Resistors Network. This is a webinar, our monthly webinar. We've been doing for almost two years now. And uh, as you well know, because you're here, uh, this one is about the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. It's called U.S. Forever Wars, Shining a Light on the War Profiteers. So we're very happy to be hosting this, especially since the first session of the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal is coming up very quickly next month. And uh, one of our presenters, Brad Wolf, will certainly tell us about that. Um, so before we actually get started with our presenters, and I'll introduce them here in a second, uh, I'd like Christian Sorensen to give us a little spiel about War Industry Resistors Network and, and also uh, a little bit of research that he's doing uh, in the near future. Before we get to Christian, though, um, I do want to um, raise our attention to what's going on in Gaza right now. And I know many of us are heartbroken about the events there. And I would like to call just for a moment of silence so we can meditate and pray and, and be in a community of concern about the people suffering there. Okay, thank you. Thank you all um, from my heart and from the heart of all of you all to Gaza. Um, so we'll start with Christian. Uh, Christian, over to you, if you will. All right, thank you, Ken. So the War Industry Resistors Network, or WERN, is a loose grouping of over 40 organizations that work to counter the business of war and militarism in general. We'll put the uh, network's links in the chat in a little bit. Uh, the network's main focus at this point is education. And it does that through holding webinars like the one this evening. These webinars have covered almost every aspect of the war industry from lobbyists and Congress to how think tanks produce information justifying war and broad military deployments to how war industry technology is used on the borders and deep inside the United States, how the war industry sells to some of the most brutal regimes on earth, and more. As there are war corporations all over the United States, so too there are people and groups who oppose these corporations. The executives at these corporations and the top shareholders could steer their respective businesses in any direction, but they choose to stay in the business of war. And that's why tonight's guests are so important and uh, I'm very excited to learn from them. Just a quick note about current events, what Ken was talking about. Israel couldn't do what it does without the US war industry and support from the US government. For example, Boeing's JDAM kits, Lockheed Martin's Sikorsky cargo aircraft, for moving troops and weaponry, Jacobs construction for Israeli military installations, General Electric engines, on and on and on. If the U.S. public wants to help Palestine, then it, the U.S. public can convert the war industry's industrial capacity to beneficial fields, and the war industry convert it to beneficial fields, public transit, international scientific endeavors, environmental remediation, infrastructure, and on and on. The next WERN webinar will be November 2nd. It's titled, Running Up to War Against China, featuring KJ No, NOH. The link will be in the chat in a second. WERN will also host a webinar in early December about Israel's role in the global arms trade, and that features Jeff Halper, founder of the Israel Committee Against Home Demolition. So stay tuned. 
So tonight, in coordination with Mass Peace Action, we welcome the Merchants of Deaths, the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal, and they make a meticulous legal case against some of the top U.S. war corporations. And Ken is here to introduce them. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm very excited for tonight's presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. All right, we have three presenters that we're very happy to have with us, and I'm going to read all three of their intros, all three of their um, resumes here, uh, and then um, we'll let them have at it, one after the other. So our first presenter is Brad Wolf. He's a former lawyer, a prosecutor, community college dean. He is executive director of Peace Action Network of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, coordinator of the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. Brad writes for numerous publications and his forthcoming book on the writings of Philip Berrigan entitled A Ministry of Risk will be published by Fordham University Press in March 2024. Norman Solomon is an American journalist, media critic, author, and activist. His latest book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine, was published by the New Press in June 2023. In a starred review, Kirkus Reviews called the book a powerful, necessary indictment of efforts to disguise the human toll of American foreign policy. Solomon's other books include War Made Easy, How Presidents and Pundits Keep Spinning Us to Death. The Los Angeles Times calls the book brutally persuasive and a must read. The newspaper's reviewer added, Solomon is a formidable thinker and activist. Norman is the founder of the Institute for Public Accuracy, a consortium of policy researchers and analysts, analysts, where he is the executive director. He's co-founder and director of the activist organization RootsAction.org, which now has upwards of 1 million online supporters. Amazing. Aisha Juman, Dr. Juman, is the founder and president of Yemen Relief and Reconstruct <clears throat> Reconstruction Foundation. The foundation aims to increase awareness among the U.S. public and policymakers about the humanitarian crises underway in Yemen, support relief and reconstruction efforts, and facilitate campaigns to bring peace to the country. Aisha has over 35 years of experience in public health, including vital vaccine preventable diseases, cervical and breast cancer research, surveillance, maternal and child health, nutrition, and primary health care. So thank you, all three of you, and Brad Wolf, over to you. Thank you, Ken. Good evening, everybody. And I want to thank uh, Norman and Aisha for joining us tonight, especially. They've been very helpful to the tribunal, providing us with a lot of information and guidance along the way. So thanks for joining us tonight and, and sharing again with a wider audience. So the War Crimes Tribunal, after almost two years of some very hard work, we are ready for the opening session of the tribunal, which will occur on November 12th. It's a Sunday evening, right after Armistice Day. It's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And I am going to put in the chat box, right, uh, a link for you to register. And I would love you to all to register and to share that link with everybody you've ever met because we want to get as many people registered for this opening session of the tribunal as possible. So I'm going to explain a little bit about what a People's Tribunal is, what we're doing here, uh, how we've gathered evidence and how we'll deliver the evidence. A people's tribunal occurs when the courts have been captured by the criminals. And so the citizenry rises up and decides to hold accountable either a government, corporate actors, or individual for national violation of national or international crimes. Some of you may be familiar with the Bertrand Russell Tribunal of the 1960s that held the American government accountable for crimes against humanity in Vietnam. There was the 2005 World Tri Tribunal in Iraq that was uh, doing the same for the American government in Iraq. Recently, there's been the People's Tribunal on United States imperialism, a tribunal on police brutality against minorities in the United States. Our tribunal, the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal, takes its name from the original Merchants of Death, after World War I, Congress investigated certain companies, discovering that these companies had intentionally led the United States into war for profit, and they named them the Merchants of Death. And so 100 years later, this is still happening. 
and our tribunal seeks to hold accountable weapons manufacturers in the United States for crimes against humanity and war crimes, because we believe that profit drives war to a very large extent. We're not seeking to hold the government accountable. We're seeking to hold private corporations accountable. We want to shine a light on exactly what they do, how they do it, and the results of their terrible deeds. And the idea is for us to collect evidence over these last two years. And what we've been doing is collecting documentary evidence and testimonial evidence. And we're recording that. And we're going to be presenting that not just to our judges, who I'll mention in a minute. We have 11 judges from across the globe who will be deliberating on all this evidence. Well, we want to present that to a very broad public. And we're, we're creating video documents. And these documents are approximately 30 to 60 minutes in length. And they're going to cover specific topics as to how the merchants of death attain their goals. There'll be lobbying, think tanks, the revolving door. But we're also going to be focusing on specific countries where the merchants of death, where weapons manufacturers have gained undue influence in the United States foreign policy and fomented needless war in places like Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia. Each of these episodes we have created working with writers and researchers and film editors overseen by lawyers such as Marjorie Cohn and Bill Quigley to help guide us on the law. We've created these videos to be story documents. So rather than the tribunals you may be familiar with where people are simply looking into a camera and talking like I am right now, these are going to be stories that contain the evidence we've found. So there will be a narrator, a video, images, interviews with victims, interviews with military analysts, interviews with retired military officers, uh, theologians and attorneys, all presented in these video segments that will be approximately 30 minutes to 60 minutes per segment. And so our hope in creating these video segments is that they will be shareable among a lot of people. We'll send out links each week for the next episode and people can watch it at their convenience, share it with groups. And we encourage you to create watch parties each week, uh, either with peace and social groups in your community, uh, church groups, uh, whatever it may be. Have these watch parties, you can watch these videos and hopefully, this is our big hope, is they will get into colleges and high schools because the videos are going to be online on our website and available for teachers to use. So if an instructor or a professor wants to pull down a video about the United States involvement in Afghanistan and look at it from the perspective of how the merchants of death may have been involved, how weapons manufacturers may have been seeking profit in this particular war and influenced unduly. United States foreign policy, they can do so. They can show this and get a perspective. And they can listen to people we've interviewed, like Norman Solomon, like Aisha Juman, like Christian Sorensen, William Astori, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, uh, Matt Akins, Jeffrey Stern, all kinds of individuals, Cornell West, John Pilger, uh, Richard Falk. Some very esteemed people, very knowledgeable people, as well as victims who are trying to tell the story from their perspective. And, and that too was part of our goal here was tell this story from the perspective of the victims, of, of what's happening to them as these profiteers are taking so much money from the US Treasury. So we couldn't indict all, all weapons manufacturers in the United States. So we selected four that we thought were indicative of the entire US war industry. And those four are Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, and the drone maker, General Atomics. So we selected those four, and we charged them with war crimes and crimes against humanity. And what this tribunal lacks in legal authority, because this is not a legal proceeding, this is a people's proceeding. What it may lack in legal authority, it makes up with the moral indictment of a citizenry speaking out against it. This is, again, what occurs when a government fails to act. If a government is not going to hold accountable weapons manufacturers for creating needless war, 
and all of this suffering across the globe, while at the same time, they're draining the U.S. Treasury to the tune of a trillion dollars a year. If the government will not hold these people accountable, then the people will. So this is grassroots justice. This is the way it has to be. And if we shine a light on these profiteers through these videos, through appearing at their offices, through conversations with your neighbors and friends and family, hopefully we can generate a change, a change in perspective where these wars don't seem inevitable, but we see them for what they are, which is corporations seeking billion dollar contracts at U.S. taxpayer expense and also at the very great expense of the victims of these wars across the globe. So I had mentioned the uh, jurors, and I wanted to tell you exactly who we've selected to be judges and jurors on the tribunal. It's a very esteemed panel, and we worked very hard to try to find people that were representative of many of the countries who have been the targets of these merchants of death uh, and make it as diverse as possible. So we have, as I mentioned, Marjorie Cohn, uh, international lawyer and, and, and professor of law. We have Ajuma Baraka from the Black Alliance for Peace. We have Basir Bita, a human rights worker from Afghanistan. We have Anne Wright, retired colonel from the United States Army. Matthew Ho, retired U.S. Marine and former candidate for the Senate in North Carolina. We have Denora La Luz Feliciano, a lawyer and professor from Puerto Rico. Mazin Kumsaya, the founder and director of the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity at Bethlehem University. Abdi Ismail Samitar, who is a member of the Somali parliament and a professor at the University of Minnesota. Ibrahim Salih, who is a medical doctor and an author from Iraq. Arwa Mokdad, who is with the Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation and Rane Masri, who is a Lebanese-American human rights activist. So these are the 11 jurors or judges who we will be presenting our evidence to. They will listen to it over the weeks that we submit the evidence, just as you will, and then they will deliberate and they will render a verdict. And at the conclusion of all of the evidence submitted, and we expect this probably to take 12 to 15 weeks with videos being released each week to view and deliberate on. At the end of that time, they will deliberate on the evidence and render a verdict. So we will come together for a live streamed event for them to render the verdict. And after that, they will issue a written report that will have the detailed reasons as to their verdict. And we hope that report becomes a living document right alongside the videos that will be a living document. So <clears throat> when this registration link that I sent out to you, when, when we do this coming up on November 12th, what we're going to do that evening at this opening session at the opening gavel is to have a live streamed event where we will be introducing our jurors and ourselves. We'll be talking a little bit about the tribunal, and we're going to start that night uh, releasing one of our first videos. Certainly what's going on in Gaza right now is at the top of our radar, and we've already completed a video episode called Operation Cast Lead, which was about the heinous invasion of Gaza in 2008-2009. We selected that particular episode because at the time that we did it, which was before this past week's events, we thought that was representative of the many incursions into Gaza by Israel. We would want to use that and highlight what's been going on recently as well. So there'll be opportunities for viewing material and discussion on events like that and evidence to be submitted to these jurors like that. So what do we hope to gain by doing all this? Well, our belief is knowledge is power. And once we have the knowledge and we share the knowledge widely, many people are fair-minded people. And when armed with the correct knowledge, with a different perspective about what's going on, they will make the right decisions. And those decisions might be how they vote, how they participate in particular nonviolent actions in the streets, how they talk to their neighbors, family, and friends. But it's about changing minds. And as an educational document, as a living document, we think these videos will be the best way to proceed. Now, there are 
opportunities for all of you to get involved that I wanted to address, um, action items to do. Most importantly, we have already been to these weapons manufacturers. Last November 10th, we delivered uh, subpoenas to them, uh, to the corporate headquarters of each of the four defendants in the Arlington, Washington, D.C. area. We returned on February 14th to deliver citations for contempt to each of them. Now, we're going to go back and give them another visit this coming November 8th in Washington, D.C. We're going to be visiting one of the four corporate defendants, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, or General Atomics. And if you'd like to join us, please email me. I'll place my email address in the box. Email me and let me know, and I can provide you with details. A number of us are going to be going down. We'll be engaging in a nonviolent action in front of the corporate headquarters of one of our four defendants. And it's designed to, again, bring attention to the tribunal and bring attention to exactly what they are doing with U.S. taxpayer funds. If you can't join us in Washington, plan an action that day in your own community. There are weapons manufacturers in every single community. And I'm going to post online right here in the chat box, if I can copy this correctly, a link. If you're not familiar with this, this will show you exactly what weapons manufacturers are in your community. So if you type in your, uh, your locale or your zip code, it'll bring up all the weapons makers, defense contractors in your community. Pick one of those and uh, engage in a protest in front of those for the merchants of death. If you need signage or anything like that, you can go to merchantsofdeath.org. It's merchantsofdeath.org. You can email me there. All of our information is available at merchantsofdeath.org. Uh, we've got videos, we've got subpoenas, we've got action items and, and everything else like that. So uh, again, watch the, uh, watch the video, share the link, share the registration link, do what you can in your community, feed the information back to us because we will post it on the Merchants of Death website so we can see what's going on in all these different communities as we go forward. So again, the chain of events will be November 8th, Day of Action in Washington, November 12th, opening gavel session November, uh, that will be live streamed. And then each week thereafter, all people who have registered will be receiving video links for the next episode of the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. We all have a duty to resist, to stand up and engage in nonviolent resistance, particularly at this time. And this tribunal is a method of doing that. It is another way of engaging in nonviolent resistance. It is a way of informing the public and empowering the public. And so we would ask you all to please join us, help us, and support us. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And uh, now over to you, Norman Solomon. We're all familiar with the phrase military industrial complex. We could uh, really extend it to the military industrial media complex, especially in a society that has elements of democracy. It's necessary to at least get sufficient public support or prevent getting too much active opposition. And so, the major media outlets in the United States are just as essential to the US war machinery as the bombs and the tanks and the bullets and the jets. And we experience that in many different contexts. In our lifetimes, there have been many wars that the United States has armed, sometimes directly participated in, and supplied weaponry for other countries to perhaps unknown to even the US public, but with our tax dollars, if not in our names, kill and maim, cause famine, cause disease, cause destruction. And one of the challenges for us then is as human beings, as activists, to come to terms with what the media apparatus of the United States really is. There are exceptions almost at all times, whether a war is being covered or not. 
it's rare that we could say news media never do something or always do something. The essence of propaganda is repetition. The code words catch phrases, the adjectives, who is heard, who is not heard, upon whom empathy is provided and expressed or not. It's a process of humanizing certain victims of war and dehumanizing others either through omission or through cliches and stereotypes and tacit discounting of their own humanity. And we've seen that so many different times. It's unfortunately <clears throat> an ongoing uh, pattern. So for our uh, purposes to try to make this a better world, we have that challenge to bring to light the actual role <clears throat> of news media and to change it and to confront the relationships between the media establishment and the warfare state. Part of the role of the media establishment is to pretend that there is no warfare state, to give an invisibility to the profit-taking, to the voracious drive to maximize profits that really propels so many, not just names we know of uh, corporations, but ones we don't. And so the largest uh, military contractors, and I don't think we should call them defense contractors. They may be contracting to a capital D Department of Defense, but one of the messages of news media is that we should call this lowercase d defense spending. It is not, it is military spending. It has in almost all instances, nothing to do with actual defense of people in the United States. And the warfare state requires a news media, a media terrain that holds accountable the designated enemies of the US government and lets off the hook the crimes committed by the United States government in military forms and of its allies. And so when we look at, for instance, the largest recipient of uh, US military spending, Lockheed Martin, it's, it's a stunning amount of money. The last figure I saw was uh, 63 billion with a B dollars. I mean, that's uh, an amount of money that we can't even really fathom. And it's the invisibility of these war profiteers that is in part so pernicious. But also what is pernicious is the visibility of these war profiteering huge conglomerates. You can watch TV and hear the advertisements and see the imagery for Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Raytheon, and other companies that have very big budgets. And as William Hartung has documented in his recent report that he did, I think at that time for the uh, Center for International Policy, tremendous expenditures on Capitol Hill to lobby the military contractors uh, to spend on public relations, to spend on advertising, and to spin a positive image so what's left out is that they are merchants of death. And what's included is this sort of fairy tale uh, that these huge military contractors are engaged in some sort of civic activity. And it's that pretense that is enabled through silence and through affirmation by so much of the corporate media. And that's, of course, where the silence comes in. It's the role of authentic journalists, it's the role of activists to break the silence, to fill the gaps that substitute for reality in human terms. We have essentially a death culture, a mass death culture in the United States, extremely profitable for some corporations in tandem with the government. 
And one of the ways in which the media team up with those other entities is to actively or tacitly essentially convey that there are two levels of grief that we should be concerned or not concerned with. The two tiers of grief, the people who matter and the people who don't. And so with one war after another that the United States has been actively involved in, of course, when US soldiers uh, die, when they are injured, when their loved ones grieve, they're in the, the high up tier of grief that really matters. But the people at the other end of the Pentagon firepower, they usually by omission are portrayed as in the other tier of grief. What does that say about our political culture? It says that something has become so routine, so pervasive that the corrosion is now at a very extreme level, that the willingness to only consider certain human beings on this planet to be worthy of grief. The assumption, which is the most pernicious messaging of all, the assumption that there is that tear of grief of people who really matter and that there are other people who really do not matter. That is the messaging. We've seen that directly and we've seen that indirectly. The Media Watch Group Fair documented that for uh, ex an extended period of time, MSNBC was uh, devoting enormous amounts of airtime uh, to uh, what was called Russiagate. And during that time, MSNBC devoted virtually no time to the deaths and destruction in Yemen. Keep in mind that this is not Fox News, an avowedly right-wing network. This is a supposedly liberal network. And we might say, well, uh, gee, uh, why would that be? Uh, the United States is actually involved in the slaughter for many years, the uh, arming of the Saudi-led bombing in Yemen, uh, the political support why would it be when this is a US government involvement, MSNBC wouldn't cover it? Wow, they, they didn't cover it in spite of US government involvement. I think that's not quite correct. They didn't cover it because of US government involvement. And this is a pattern that we see again and again where journalism, mass media, lets off the hook the war profiteers, lets off the hook the government clients of the war profiteers, lets off the hook those who commit large, large volume war crimes, depending on who is killing and who is being killed. Part of our challenge is to confront that dynamic and change it. Okay, thank you so much, Norman. And uh, let me just remind you that the subtitle for this Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal webinar is Shining a Light on the War Profiteers. And uh, it's pretty key what Norman had to talk about the way the media does not shine light on the war profiteers. And that's what the War Crimes Tribunal is about trying to do. So uh, now, Aisha, Dr. Aisha Juman, uh, it's your turn. Please go ahead. Thank you all for inviting me to be with you today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the U.S. role uh, in the Saudi-led war on Yemen. And um, this war has been going on since 2015 and continues to today. Okay, I'm trying to get the page to move on. Okay. Let's start with a map of Yemen, just to show you that Saudi Arabia is to the north of Yemen, and then we have Oman. And since the war started in 2015, 
people in Yemen have not had a chance to escape the, the bombing because the two countries uh, that border Yemen would not allow the passages through. And then there is also a blockade on Yemen uh, that is manned by the Saudi, but also by the US government. So people cannot escape by sea either. There are about 4 million people in Yemen who are internally displaced today. To, uh, if you look at where the Saudi get their weapon, the majority of their weapon actually from uh, the US government, Saudi Arabia buys the most weapons from the US government. If you look at the numbers, arms imports from the US between 2008 and 18 was $13.72 billion, which is about 60% of all arms imports. And then arms import from the US between two, in, in 2018, after the war in Yemen started, was 3.35 billion, which is 80% of the arms that was imported by Saudi Arabia. If we look at, again at the total numbers or percent of the US sales to, to Saudi, we have between 2011 and 2015, 32% of all arms sales that went from the US went to Saudi Arabia. And during the war years, it's 37% of all arms sales that went to from the United States went to Saudi Arabia. And all of that was used against the Yemeni people. Unfortunately, regardless of who is in office, the arms sales to Saudi Arabia continued 2015 was the highest number with $20 billion. And that is when uh, President Obama was in office. We also see 17.17 billion when President uh, Trump was in office. And this continues to today. These are the Yemen air raids timeline per month from 2015 to December 2021. And the red line here shows the civilian casualties. And there are times when in a month there were about 1,000 air raids on Yemen. And air raids is not airstrikes, it's a group of airstrikes. I will um, look in for data between September 2017 to March 2021 and some events that influence the number of airstrikes uh, or the daily air attacks on Yemen. So when the UN Human Rights Council voted to launch the group of ex eminent experts to monitor and investigate human rights violations in Yemen, there was a decline in air rates on Yemen to about 350 per month. And then that went up again. And then when the first report by the group came out, there was again a decline in air rates. And this is when Jamal Khashoggi was killed, massacred by the Saudi in the Istanbul um, embassy. Um, and then we again saw an, an increase uh, in strikes after the UN Human Rights Council voted to end the monitoring and investigation into the human rights violation in Yemen. Of course, the Saudi used incentives and threats to shut down the UN investigation in Yemen, and the US and the UK both supported that effort. Civilian deaths and injuries in Yemen doubled since the UN Human Rights Monitors was removed in 2021. And this is more than 60 killed, including children in airstrikes in Yemen. This is from uh, MSF, where at least five of their hospitals were targeted, and one on the day, a new hospital they had just built for cholera treatment, and it was targeted the day it was going to open. And it says, unjustifiable Saudi-led coalition airstrike kills at least 82 people and injures hundreds. Another one, over 100 dead or wounded in Yemen airstrikes, according to ICRC. And this one specifically, it's our my parents' neighborhood. Um, my parents and, and the larger family were at home when they hit this neighborhood. The explosion was so large, it affected many neighborhoods uh, miles away. 
bombing of schools by Saudi-led coalition is a flagrant attack on the future of Yemeni children. Uh, there are a lot of schools that were targeted and hospitals. 50% uh, of the Yemeni health centers today are either completely or partially damaged due to their strikes. Blind, blind airstrikes, civilian victims of Saudi-led uh, coalition airstrikes in Yemen. This is another one on another hospital, at least 11 dead after Saudi coalition bombs a hospital. Saudi should be blacklisted over Yemen hospital attack. But again, every time something like this comes up at the UN, the US prevents it from moving forward. This is another MSF hospital. Three years after Abs hospital bombing, airstrike continued to hit civilians. This is Human Rights Watch. Yemen Saudi led funeral attack is a parent war crime. So there was a funeral and uh, they attacked the funeral with double strikes, meaning they attacked it the first time. And when the people, the emergency response came in to rescue the people who were attacked, uh, another attack uh, have happened as well. U.S. allies have killed thousands of Yemeni civilians from the air after 22 died at a wedding in one village. People ask why. There are at least three weddings that were attacked. Saudi Arabia also deliberately targeted impoverished Yemen farms and agriculture industry. Anything that was producing food in Yemen was targeted. Also, Saudi airstrikes in Yemen hit facilities providing water to hundreds of thousands facing, facing cholera epidemic. Yemen faced the largest cholera outbreak in record, recorded in history with over 1.2 million suspected cases due to the destruction of the water supplies and electricity. U.S. supplies bomb that killed 40 children on a Yemen school bus. 11 adults also died and 79 people were uh, wounded. The bomb was sold, Saudi Arabia was made by Lockheed Martin. Yemen coalition boss bombing apparent war crime. And this is again after the bombing of the school bus, Trump certified that Saudi Arabia was not committing any um, and in, they, they certified that they were still fine and not committing any crimes and continued selling them weapons. This is from Amnesty. Yemen, yes, made bomb kills and maims children in a deadly air, air strike on residential home. This is a different one than the school bus. The majority of the airstrikes were actually on, in, on homes. This is from Human Rights Watch saying that at least 90 apparently unlawful Saudi-led airstrikes in Yemen, including on Yemeni fishing boats, uh, attacks, there were at least 12 attacks per day that bombed hospitals, school buses, markets, mosques, farms, bridges, factories, and detention centers. This is from um, Rokana and Bernie Sanders, Saudi warplanes, carpet bomb Yemen with US help. This must end. Yemen war will have killed over 377 by the end of 2021. I know as a public health professional that this is a hugely underestimate because a lot of people in Yemen die because of the blockade and infectious diseases at home and nobody is counting those deaths. Biden, when he ran for office, he promised to end the war on Yemen. Unfortunately, when he when he entered office, that didn't happen. This is from the Brookings Institute. Uh, it's Biden broken promise on Yemen. And of course, Saudi gets their first major arms deal, uh, arms deal under Biden with air to air missiles. Biden is enabling uh, America's indefensible history with Saudi Arabia. In many ways, this unquestioning support for the Saudi dictatorship is unremarkable. And it says here that Biden sustained in his 
his perfect record of never condemning Saudi Arabia for its devastation of Yemen. And this is from uh, Rayathan um, saying peace not going to break out anytime soon. This is the Rayathan CEO, sees solid growth in the Middle East. Um, this is the exact quote. Look, peace is not going to break out in the Middle East anytime soon. I think it remains an area where we will continue to see solid growth. Same thing with Martin Lockheed, uh, where he's the CEO says, I don't think that we will have a more open in my environment for military sales and direct commercial sale to international uh, partners. So they don't, they both agree that the Biden administration will allow them, allow them to continue to sell arms. This is William Hartung, the Biden administration missile sales Saudi Arabia is offensive and must be stopped. White House pushes to derail Sanders, major cutting Saudi support. There was a, uh, a resolution that Bernie Sanders wanted to introduce last December. And on the day that he was going to introduce this, the White House called him and asked him to stop uh, putting the resolution through. If you want to know more about the war in Yemen, uh, this is an excellent resource. It's the Saudi-led war in Yemen, frequently answer uh, questions. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aisha. I, I know that most of us know about Yemen and the disaster that's been going on there for so long, said to be the greatest humanitarian catastrophe. Of course, they're seeing a sort of mirror image of that now in Palestine. Um, you know, these people, they make profits on this war and suffering. Uh, it's, it's criminals too easy a word. It is really evil. Um, so here we see Yemen as a case study, really, one of, among others, of these merchants of death who are not only profiting from war, but um, promoting it. You know, if your business model is selling weapons of war, then that means uh, your marketing plan is war. You have to have war to sell your your weapons. And of course, they have many lobbyists that make that happen. And we see the results of it in places like Yemen. So thank you for sharing that difficult and hard story. Um, so now what we are going to do, uh, we have taken up the uh, habit of having an action every time we do a webinar uh, to do something uh, while we're online to uh, send a word, a plea, a message to our elected officials. And so now I'm going to have Brian Garvey, ask Brian Garvey to uh, lead us in that. Thank you, Ken. And our action tonight, and I'm sure it comes as no surprise, uh, is calling for a peace, an end to this war uh, in Gaza. Uh, as quickly as possible before it escalates even further out of control. Um, so there is a piece of legislation that has been introduced by one of the few members of, of Congress, uh, Cory Bush, out of Missouri, uh, who has introduced legislation calling for an immediate ceasefire. Um, and this is something that we have seen most members of Congress uh, unwilling to do, uh, unwilling to say that we need an end to the violence immediately and negotiations uh, to end this war. Um, so this piece of legislation that she has filed is very clear. It calls for first ceasefire and negotiations. And second, it calls for humanitarian aid uh, to be sent into Gaza. Uh, we have seen in, you know, a little over the last week, 
thousands of bombs uh, rained down from one of the most powerful militaries in the world uh, on one of the poorest places and most densely po populated places in the world. Um, so we need to raise our voices. Um, I know it's a, it's a low bar, but one thing that I have been seeing, and maybe you have as well, is the press, the media, is actually focused a bit more on the plight of Palestinians than it has uh, in recent years. And I think that is because the people are demanding it. Um, I know uh, just a personal anecdote. Um, we had an editorial in our big newspaper up here called the Boston Globe uh, that said that we should stand in lockstep with Israel, um, uh, that uh, we shouldn't even consider uh, a de-escalation or a ceasefire. And the paper was flooded with letters saying that this is outrageous. And they printed them. And uh, I have noticed that the coverage has been a little more honest um, since. So, you know, what we can do is make noise. And if you want to direct some of that noise to your uh, representative, please click. It just takes a minute. Just put your name in. You can personalize the message as much as you can. But please, uh, we need all of you to call uh, for Yep, and, and thank you, Richard, for mentioning that. Um, it also asks for, for us to stop uh, uh, giving military aids, stop funding, stop giving the bombs to Israel that are being dropped uh, on Gaza. So thank you so much for taking action. I really appreciate it. Uh, keep your voices loud. Thank you, Brian. And Brian posted uh, the link in the chat for you to click on. It take, doesn't even take a minute. So if you would do that, that's a small thing, but an important thing to do. And share it with your friends, too. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, everyone. So now we have, we're at 8.55, um, and we're going to have 15, 20 minutes worth of questions and answers with our presenters. And um, as you know, many of you have been on our webinars before. The way we do this is you go to the reactions box and you raise your hand. There's a feature in the reactions box to raise your hand. And you can see a couple of people have done it already. And uh, I'll call on you and you'll get to ask a question. Uh, I do ask, always ask, please um, confine your comments, make them brief, and do have a question for our presenters. But what we don't want is people going on and on with a speech. So. So if you would, please, if you have a comment, make it brief and then ask our presenters a question and um, let's go with that. So I see Jeffrey, uh, go ahead, Jeffrey, you're first. With what you guys are planning to do, to do involving the war crimes tribunal, aren't you, aren't you guys scared for your lives? I mean, if the government finds, finds out, you could be, you guys could be targeted for assassination. Isn't that, isn't that, am I right or am I wrong? Um, Brad or whoever sure. you want. To... Yeah, I, I, you know, it was interesting. We went to Raytheon, Lockheed Martin Boeing, and General Atomics uh, a year ago. The second time we went in February, uh, they knew we were coming. So clearly they were reading email and things like that. Um, we hadn't publicized certain parts of the actions that particular day, but they were aware of them. They, the police who met us there, had my picture. Um, we were going to the Pentagon after the Raytheon building. Uh, they had my picture there and and uh, they were very nice, you know, but they knew exactly where I had been and they knew where I was going. And we had not released that information publicly other than email exchanges between a small group of individuals. So I have no doubt that somebody's, you know, tapping into somebody's email at some point. As far as our lives being in danger, I just I don't have concern for anything like that. But, um, you know, hacking into email and things like that, our organization's website was just taken over tonight um, and has been hacked and hijacked and people are putting, uh, somebody is putting other things out there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically my thought about this. I think that we are in good company with a lot of nonviolent resistance actors over the years. Um, when we get down on November 8th, we will be risking arrest. And there's some 
some risk there, but I don't believe to our lives. I think it's important to get this story out, to get it out in the form that we're doing it. I think it's a unique form of video story. And uh, so we we'll hope we're successful with that. Thank you, Brad. And I, let me add that that November 8th action, uh, some of us from Wern are going to be there. And I would encourage all of you on this call, if you're within striking distance to come November 8th, uh, even if you don't want to risk arrest, we need as many people there holding signs and chanting as we can get. So this is something that, um, you know, it's right up a Warren's alley, right? It's about the war profiteers. So we're there to, to support and help be part of it. Um, so I see, I'm going to hope I pronounce this name right, Moji Aga. Uh, it's your turn. Please go ahead and Hi, ask your salam. This is Moji Aga Mushtaba Aga Mohammadi. Uh, hello, Sister Aisha. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, I have a little question for you at the end, which is difficult. I'm an Iranian American peace activist for a long time. And, and part of what I am doing is to try to undemonize our brown-skinned Muslim people. And that's something that I hope that this speaking tour that I am I am uh, organizing with the help of the Unitarian Universalist uh, congregations around the country, also hoping to foster a truth and reconciliation, native slash American truth and reconciliation process. That's something that, that the way I try to contribute by being a an advocate for nonviolence with the wrong kind of skin. And so I uh, so I am hoping that uh, that especially white people in this country begin to understand that that you know there are a lot of things that have been done in the, in the in their names. And I'll send the link to this. And my question for Sister Aisha, you're from Yemen, I'm from Iran originally. So, and I am so sick and tired of that regime in Iran that is using people of Yemen, Yemen um, to, and also same thing that it uses Palestinians for, to advance its, uh, you know, hegemonic, so-called Islamic agenda. Tell me about your feelings. I I feel I am in a between a rock and a hard place. In this country, I am demonized, and then the regime uh, has a has a in absentia execution order for me. Um, so tell me, say something about, you know the horrible um, abuse of Yemen by the regime in Iran. Thank you, sister. Wa alaikum salam, brother Moji. Um, in terms of Iran role in Yemen, it's actually quite limited. Uh, if you read a lot of the work that's by, even by the Wall Street Journal, uh, Iran's hands in Yemen are extremely small. Um, they may invest very little uh, in, in comparison to with the Saudi, uh, with the U.S. And, and the British and the French uh, help are doing. So I don't think the Yemeni government, especially the one in Sana'a, uh, I think they are allies with Iran, but I don't think they listen to Iran or would accept directives from Iran. They are actually fiercely independent. And they've been, um, you know, uh, even in Congress, uh, people have testified that Iran's role in Yemen is very limited. And actually, uh, the war on Yemen has strengthened Iran's hand uh, more than it would have been if there was no war in Yemen. Thank you. Uh, Donald Smith, you're next. Oh, hi, um, uh, Ms. Juman. Um, I know there was some sort of ceasefire 
six months or a year ago or something like that in Yemen? What were the effects, if any, of that? And so tell me the story of that, please. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. So yes, in April of 2022, um, a ceasefire into, entered into effect uh, for six months, actually two months, that was then uh, renewed for another two months and another two months, so for six months. Since then, there is a de facto uh, ceasefire, but it has not been signed or discussed. Part of the uh, deals that were agreed upon uh, during the ceasefire is lifting the blockade on Yemen and allowing some flights from Sana'a airport, which is the main airport uh, in Yemen, to both Jordan and uh, Cairo. So far, only three flights are allowed from Sana'a to Jordan, Amman. That's about it. Uh, Cairo didn't come through. And there are still, uh, you know, skirmishes around the border with Saudi Arabia, with Saudi bombarding Yemen on a daily basis. And I'm not sure if you read the news about um, the Ethiopian migrants that were slaughtered by the Saudi on the border between Yemen and, and, and Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis continue to uh, barrage Yemen with artillery fire. Um, they're still trying to negotiate an extension to that uh, peace deal or ceasefire, but that has not happened. Okay, uh, thank you. Bernie Holland. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to express my appreciation to Brad, Aisha, and Norman for the very concise and effective presentations they've given us this evening. Um, I'd like to um, I'll, I'll just uh, explain. I'm in London, UK, and I'm with uh, a number of organisations. Um, ICANN, have you heard of ICANN? Um, also, Uniting for Peace, we have a conference coming up tomorrow. Um, we have Medea Benjamin on it, one of the speakers. And I'm also um, a member of the International Peace Coalition, which is organized by the Schiller Institute, which is um, organized by a, a wonderful lady by the name of Helga Zettlerouche. So that's who I'm involved with. So now for my question, I'll make this very quick. Um, we're talking about the emergence of death. Um, the facilitators of death. What about people like Blinken and Biden, Newland, these people? Should, should, should not these people be held to account? Is it possible to hold them to account? That's my question to, to all of you. Good question, who wants to do that? I'll go very quickly and then turn it over. I can see Norman's leaning forward, but I would say yes. Your, uh, your, your to your question, the answer is yes. They should be held accountable without a doubt. Other tribunals have sought to hold government officials accountable. We wanted to focus on corporations, basically to follow the money, because we thought once people realized that we were getting involved in these wars for profit for corporations to generate billions of dollars of profit, that would lead to a sense of outrage that in turn may end up holding people like Blinken, Biden, and others accountable. Of course, unfortunately, the United States refuses to be part of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the only accountability process is really through grassroots organizing uh, in terms of the Biden and Blinken types. And that means, um, of course, especially in the United States, a, a media activist and a political process. Yeah, okay, thank you. Right with you, Bernie, good question. Uh, about two years ago with the blockade in Yemen and, and the war, um, there was a Harvard article by um, multiple lawyers there that actually made an argument that the US government is complicit in the war crimes in Yemen. Thank you. 
Uh, okay, on to the next. We have three. I can see three hands raised. Maybe that'll that'll be it for this evening. Let's see. Miles, is it flag? Flag? Go ahead. Correct. Oki, Donatata, Tansi, hello and greetings in some of the various languages, Treaty 7 territory, Alberta, Canada. If I'm having a proper business meeting, I would perhaps pull out Robert's Rules of Order, Parliamentary Procedure. I'm wondering with respect to the tribunal, is there such an authority that you go by for procedures and, and uh, you know, the due process? And what is that called or what jurisdiction would that be in? Thank you. What we've tried to do, and, and I should mention that I'm a former prosecutor. And so I was working along with Kathy Kelly and Nick Modern, who are also co-coordinators of this tribunal. We've been working with Bill Quigley, attorney, and Marjorie Cohn, attorney, to establish some procedure and some rules of order. So. When we served these defendants with subpoenas last year, they were known as subpoenas deuces tecum, which were subpoenas demanding documentary information that would either incriminate or exonerate the defendants. They failed to comply. We followed that up with contempt citations, which were served on them in February. That process is the same process that would occur in a criminal trial. So as much as possible, we are trying to adhere to the standards of a criminal trial. We ask them to come and be a part of that tribunal to testify, to offer whatever evidence they wanted to in defense of themselves against these charges. They've failed to do so. So the, that's the procedure we're trying to follow to make it as much like a trial as we can, yet nevertheless understanding this is a people's tribunal and somewhat outside the boundaries of national and international procedure. Good. Um, let me pop in with a question I see in the chat and then over to you, Cynthia. Hold on one, one moment. The question in the chat, which I wonder too, uh, Brad, you're probably the right person to answer this. Uh, it's from Donald Smith, who already asked the question, but his question is, will the media grant any coverage to these trials? Um, how are you going about that, Brad, getting media coverage? So that is our hope. When we went down to deliver the subpoenas and contempt citations, we did press releases. We contacted all the media outlets, and we had somebody from the local NPR station show up. That was it. One of the ironic uh, things about that subpoena delivery was that in Raytheon's headquarter was an ABC television uh, subsidiary in the building itself. And we went and we knocked on the door in the building of Raytheon and said, we're about to deliver these subpoenas. Would you like to come upstairs? And they locked the doors on us and they refused to come out. So that was the response that we got from media. We hope that when we return on this November 8th, that we will generate some media response with our actions. That's the intention of doing this. And with the high caliber of individuals we have testifying before us that we're gonna be presenting, we hope that too is gonna to raise the attention such that media will address this. We're gonna write about it, we're gonna promote it, we're gonna do everything we can. If they don't, we're still gonna to try to get it into the educational institutions that we can so we can address this to young people because we feel that's very important. Thank you. Okay, Cynthia, please go ahead. Um, I was interested in maybe doing a solidarity action here in Northern California. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, will you, is there a way for you to let us know who the target is on November 8th so that we can choose that same target here in the Bay Area and, and, uh, go to them you, and deliver we, a letter if you're delivering letters. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. And, and and we can, what we'll do is we, we did not want to release that information tonight, just uh, not just yet to, to tip them off too much in advance, but we will be able to send that to you and perhaps Ken can send that out in the follow-up to this as to exactly who it is. And I can, I can guarantee you that they have a, uh, a, a subsidiary in your area. Uh, you will have no trouble finding these individuals in your locale. Probably most people watching are going to have a subsidiary uh, of one of the four. And it can be one of the four, not necessarily the one we're going to on the eighth. So uh, I would I would emphasize that as well. You want to deliver the same kind of documents that you are. And those but, documents can be found yeah. on 
<laughs> they are they are available for download on our website, merchantsofdeath.org. If you go there, you can download the subpoena for each of the defendants, print them, and serve them. We've right. had people do that all over for the last year. So, great, thank you. Sure. You can also, I'll just add, Brad, that we've done that here in Asheville, North Carolina, and Brad and and the others in the in the tribunal are very open to us adapting some of the language to the particular locality that we were in. So we downloaded what they have on the website and we just added a little bit to it, ran it in front of Brad and he said, go with it. So, you know, work your locality as best you can. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, Jack, your turn, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I have a question, I guess, for Brad and maybe a related to, for Norman as a media critic. Is there a category under you know, prosecution for uh, willful concealment of evidence or guilty conduct? And I think about Raytheon because I really checked out their corporate website lately and all mention of their work on the long range standoff nuclear armed air launch cruise missile has been scrubbed from their website, including the press release of April 2020 that announced that our local Raytheon factory, you know, won this multi-billion dollar decades long contract. And I'm wondering if there's a category for like, you know, guilty conduct, they don't want us to talk about it because their website is full of war porn for all of the other wonderful gadgets that they make. What we, what we would do in the tribunal with that kind of information is use it as inculpatory evidence. So it shows evidence of guilt. If they're trying to cover up what they've done, we can use that as evidence of guilt in war crimes and crimes against humanity, not necessarily a separate crime, but certainly it makes them culpable in what they're doing. So these four defendants are very good at scrubbing the record when something bad happens. And I have no doubt they'll go back and try to scrub the record after the, what's going on in Gaza right now. You know, the, uh, the planes that Israel's using are manufactured by Lockheed Martin. Lockheed Martin and Israel walk in lockstep together. Israel has a subsidiary headquarters in, or Lockheed Martin has a subsidiary headquarters in Israel. So um, depending on how this thing goes, they may try to scrub that information as well. Norman, did you have anything to add? Oh, I was thinking that if lying by omission was illegal, we would have thousands of editors in the United States in prison right now. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> um, okay, let's, uh, I've got 9.15. Let's take one more question and then, um, uh, if uh, our presenters, if you three would like to say any kind of final words as we wrap up, that'll be great too. So Louise Coleman will have you ask a question and then- Thanks. Well, actually it. I was going to uh, make an offer that um, I work with Mass Peace Action here in uh, Massachusetts uh, and I distribute press releases and all kinds of uh, levels of uh, you know local, national, international, and I'd be glad to uh, circulate your press release. And you never know. Uh, I always think is, I always like try to send them out to like all the standard sorts of things, but then to try to different kinds of people too. Um, and sometimes it also depends on what else is happening. Some of the best press coverage we got about Raytheon was about it happened because there was a golf tournament happening and Raytheon was sort of involved with it. So we got lots of the local press was covering this, not because they were interested in the Raytheon so much, but it was, they were interested in golf, the golf tournament, but it, it got us all kinds of coverage. George Seven. Okay. Good. So anyway, you've got Thank my, you. you, you've got my uh, uh, email address and I'd be glad to do whatever. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Good. Thank you, Louise. Okay, Brad, I and Norman, you have any last words that you'd like to share before we call it quit? I would just encourage everybody to recognize that this is an, an action that uh, is going to be empowering. Yes, I saw a comment or a question very early on in the chat. 
given that other tribunals fail to change things, are you discouraged? What do you think will happen? And I, I, I'm not discouraged. And uh, what I think can happen is that we can maintain our human dignity by doing this particular action. Because if we do nothing, it requires us to shut down parts of our humanity. And that's probably what they want us to do, to be that technocratic kind of zombie. And to stand up and to act in the People's Tribunal like this, I think, is to assert our humanity in the face of odds. And I think eventually we will prevail. I'd add that information and action are just the essential companions, and we need the flow of information that is largely, hugely hidden from the public, and we need to absolutely refuse to go along with the messaging that is tacitly be passive. Uh, passiveness, uh, silence is death, as we know, and Activism gives the possibility of affirming life. Yes, and I would want to add that please act when you see something wrong, even if it's a tweet or a Facebook post, or when you see a story that you don't think is accurate, do say something, write to them, uh, dispute it. We need to start correcting the information. At least now we have the ability to do that through social media, although they do censor some voices, uh, which is something that we didn't have um, before the social media platforms availability. So act, do something. Um, don't, don't think our words uh, don't count or our voices don't count. We've been able to pass a Yemen war power resolution in 2018 when everybody thought that was impossible. Of course, Trump did veto it, but we were able to do that. So our vo collective voices and our individual voices do count. Thank you. Thank you, three, and thank you all for coming. Let me remind you, we do these every month, and our next one is November the 2nd. It's on the, um, the proof for war with China. We did one previously. This is another one. Uh, this time it's K.J. No. If you have seen K.J. No speak about the uh, militarization of the Pacific, uh, he, uh, he is very well informed, very compelling. Uh, he is going to do this webinar on his own. Uh, this will be the first time out of 23 webinars. We've always had at least two or three people do them. Uh, he is so uh, well versed in this that he's going to do it on his own. And then we'll take questions and answers to him, of course, afterwards. Uh, and then in December, we're going to have one it's as soon as we can get one going about uh, a disaster in Gaza and Palestine. And so um, please uh, come to that one, too. Uh, and uh, we'll let's just end on the note that Aisha uh, gave us a, a sort of a call to action. Uh, please, uh, you know, War Industry Resistors Network is a way of communicating with each other, but we certainly want all of our groups and all of our people to, to get out there and let our voices be heard. And uh, thanks for coming to this and please support the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal for sure. All right, have a good evening, everyone. Peace.